Hey everyone, ready to launch ourselves into a deep dive on the solar system. Always ready for a cosmic adventure. You guys know I love digging into the material you send, and this time we're diving into excerpts from astro0101.pdf, a German astronomy course. And let me tell you, it's visually amazing. Oh, visually stunning stuff. I'm intrigued. What kind of visuals are we talking? Seriously. We've got videos of the sun's surface bubbling away, mm -hmm. interactive 3D models of planets you can practically spin around yourself, even virtual field trips to Saturn's rings. Wow, that's next level. Sounds like they're really bringing the cosmos to life. Totally. <laughs> Having your ears perfect, by the way, because you always break down even the most complex space stuff into something we can all wrap our heads around. Well, I try. Space is for everyone, right? So, where are we starting in this course? Right from the beginning. Formation of the Solar System 101. Always a good place to start. It's mind-boggling when you really think about it. It really is. Speaking of mind-boggling, this course used a comparison that I thought was really effective, imagining the solar system shrunk down to the size of a soccer field. Oh, I like that. I use that one all the time. It's a classic for a reason. Helps put things in perspective. Right. Like, if the sun's the soccer ball, Earth is, get this, a peppercorn, about 10 meters away, a peppercorn. And that's just our neighborhood. It really hits you how vast everything is when you think about how long it would take to travel those distances, even at the speed of light. And they totally go into that. It would take light eight and a half minutes to reach Earth from the sun. Eight minutes, not too shabby, but over four hours to reach Neptune. Exactly. Four hours. Yeah. At the speed of light. It's incredible. And all that's still just a tiny speck in the Milky Way galaxy. Right. And our galaxy is just one among billions and billions in the observable universe. Makes you feel pretty small, huh? It's humbling. Okay, before we get totally lost in the vastness of space, let's zoom back in and talk about our own star. The sun. I love how this course breaks down its structure. They've got some pretty cool analogies. Like what? I'm always up for a good analogy. Okay, so they compare the sun's granulation pattern, you know, that kind of mottled look on its surface, to a boiling pot of water. You know what? That's surprisingly accurate. Those granulations are giant bubbles of plasma, some even bigger than Earth. They're literally rising and falling like water boiling on a stove. And all that energy, all that heat and light eventually radiates out towards us here on Earth. It's amazing how much energy the sun pumps out. This course also takes a planetary travelogue approach when they get to the inner planets. I love it. Yeah. Each planet is like its own character with a distinct personality. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. A cosmic drama unfolding. So which planet gets the starring role? Well, we've got to start with Mercury. It's like the elusive artist of the solar system. Super hard to observe from Earth because it's so close to the sun. Yeah, Mercury's always playing hide-and-seek with us. For sure. And this course talks about how astronomers had to get really creative to study it, using things like Mercury's transits across the sun to learn more about it. They even had to develop specialized telescopes just to get a decent glimpse. Talk about dedication. And even with all of those challenges, we've actually uncovered a surprising amount about Mercury, thanks to some amazing missions. Okay. Mariner 10 in the 70s, that was our first up-close look at its surface, all those craters. And then, of course, Messenger, which orbited Mercury for years. Right. Messenger really blew the lid off our understanding of this little planet. The composition, the magnetic field, the surprisingly active geology. Mercury is full of surprises, that's for sure. A lot more going on than meets the eye. Speaking of which... Let's move on to another planet with a lot more going on than you might initially think Venus, often called Earth's sister planet. Although this course gets a bit more dramatic with its description. Oh, how so? What do they call it? Earth's sister planet. Gone rogue. <laughs> okay, I see why they went with that. Venus definitely has that gone rogue vibe. Mm -hmm. Intense. Totally. The course talks about the incredibly dense and toxic atmosphere, the ridiculously hot surface temperatures, and don't even get me started on the crushing atmospheric pressure. It's wild. It's true, like a warning sign for what not to do when evolving a planet. Right. It makes you really appreciate the sheer willpower it must take in to even attempt landing probes on Venus, let alone actually succeed. It's an incredible testament to human ingenuity, that's for sure. Especially the scientists and engineers behind the Soviet Venera missions. Imagine being the first to see images from the surface of another planet, even if it's as extreme as Venus. That's the stuff of legends. Speaking of incredible missions, before we jump to the outer planets, how about a little detour to our very own moon? The moon. Perfect timing. I just made a fresh pot of moon cheese. Well played. 
But really, the source material goes deep on the history of lunar exploration, and there's some fascinating stuff there. It's funny how we can look up at the moon and it feels so familiar, yet it holds so many mysteries. It really does. Like, it's been this constant presence in the night sky for all of human history, inspiring countless myths and stories. And even now, scientifically speaking, it's still full of surprises. Totally. Like, how did it even get there? This course dives into the giant impact hypothesis. Ah, the classic smash and form scenario. Exactly. This idea that billions of years ago, a Mars-sized object slammed into Earth and all the debris that got blasted out, well, that eventually came together to form the moon. It sounds insane when you say it out loud, but it's the leading theory for a reason. There's a lot of evidence that supports it, like the chemical similarities between Earth and moon rocks. It makes you realize, though, that our whole solar system is a pretty chaotic place back in the day. Oh, absolutely. Planetary billiards on a grand scale. You know what gets me? We only ever see one side of the moon from Earth. That's right. It's tidally locked to Earth. Its rotation period and its orbital period are the same. So one side always faces us. We didn't even see the far side until we sent probes around the moon. It's like it's keeping half of its secrets hidden. Well, not entirely hidden. Thanks to missions like the lunar orbiters in the 60s, they mapped the far side, and it turns out it's quite different from the side we're used to seeing. More craters, fewer of those big dark Maria. A whole other world just waiting to be fully explored. Hmm. Okay, speaking of other worlds, ready to talk about the red planet. Mars. Always up for talking about Mars. One of those places that just captures the imagination, you know? 100%. And what's really exciting is that this astronomy course touches on something that feels closer than ever. The possibility of actual human missions to Mars. Right. Like, it's not just science fiction anymore. It could really happen in our lifetimes. It's incredible to think about. But before we start planning our Martian colonies, there are definitely some things we still need to understand. Like this course goes into a topic I always found a bit tricky. Retrograde motion. Ah, yes. Mars's little loop-de-loop in the sky. It confused astronomers for centuries. It really did. So for those who haven't explored this yet, what is retrograde motion? Basically, Mars sometimes appears to move backwards in its orbit. For a while, it seems to reverse course, and then it loops back around and continues in its normal direction. And it all has to do with how we're viewing it from our moving vantage point here on Earth. Right. Exactly. For the longest time, people believed in a geocentric model of the universe, with Earth at the center and everything else revolving around us. But when astronomers tried to explain Mars's weird, loopy motion with that model, it just didn't add up. It wasn't until Copernicus came along and proposed a heliocentric model with the sun at the center that things started to make sense. Another example of how our understanding of the universe has evolved over time. And sometimes it takes those head-scratching moments to push us forward. Absolutely. Those anomalies, those things that don't quite fit, they often lead to the most profound discoveries. And now, thanks to those discoveries, we've got rovers rolling around on Mars, sending back mind-blowing images and data. It's remarkable. And it's not just about exploration anymore. There are even serious discussions about terraforming Mars, making it more habitable for humans. Right. The source material mentions using cyanobacteria to potentially create a more Earth-like atmosphere on Mars. It's definitely a bold idea. Like, we're talking about literally reshaping a planet to suit our needs. It's science fiction becoming reality, but it raises all sorts of ethical and practical questions. Huge questions. Like, do we have the right to alter other planets? And even if we can, should we? Exactly. It's a debate that'll likely continue for a long time. But for now, while we ponder those big questions, let's shift gears a bit and journey beyond the inner solar system. Ready for a trip to the asteroid belt. You know, I have to admit, whenever I hear asteroid belt, my mind goes straight to those classic sci-fi movies. Mm. Spaceships dodging giant space rocks left and right. Pew, pew. It's a classic image, isn't it? Hollywood definitely loves a good asteroid chase. Who doesn't love a little space drama? But in reality, it's not quite as crowded out there as those movies make it seem, right? Not quite a cosmic demolition derby, no. The asteroid belt is huge. And while there are millions, even billions of asteroids, the distances between them are actually pretty vast. So more like a few space rocks scattered across a really, really big field. Exactly. The source actually gives a great comparison. Imagine this. On average, the distance between asteroids in the belt is about 50 times the diameter of Earth. Wow, okay. That's a lot of empty space. Makes you realize our solar system is mostly, well, 
space. Exactly. But those asteroids, even if they're not packed together like rush hour traffic, they're incredibly valuable to astronomers. Each one is like a little time capsule from the early solar system. Oh, right. Because they're basically leftovers from when the planets were forming. All right. Exactly. Studying their composition, their orbits, it gives us clues about how our solar system formed and evolved over billions of years. And of course, there's that whole planetary defense aspect, too. Got to keep an eye on any asteroids that might be a little too interested in paying Earth a visit. Right. Always good to keep an eye on those space neighbors. Speaking of which, this astronomy course had a fact about Jupiter that blew my mind. Are you ready for this? Hit me with it. Jupiter, that giant gas planet we all know and, well, maybe not love, but definitely know. It has, get this, 79 moons. 79. 79 confirmed moons. Yep. That's the most of any planet in our solar system. And it's not just the quantity. It's the variety. Some of those moons are bigger than planets in other solar systems. Yeah, seriously. It's like its own little mini solar system out there. It really is. And some of those moons are pretty intriguing in their own right. Like Europa and Ganymede, they're thought to have vast oceans of liquid water beneath their icy surfaces. Subsurface oceans. Okay, now that's the kind of science fiction I can get behind. Right. And then there's Saturn, the Lord of the Rings. Can't forget about those rings. Uh, funny, they look so solid and permanent in pictures. But I remember learning they're actually made up of billions of tiny particles all orbiting Saturn together. It's true. And those particles range in size from tiny dust grains to, like, house-sized boulders all just swirling around Saturn in this incredibly thin disk. We're talking, like, only about 30 feet thick on average. Seriously. That's thinner than a two-story building. Yeah. And it stretches across millions of miles. Mm -hmm. Space never ceases to amaze me. It's mind-boggling, right? And we wouldn't have this level of understanding without missions like Cassini-Huygens. That little spacecraft spent over a decade orbiting Saturn, sending back stunning images and data about the planet, its rings, and its moons. Amazing. Okay, before we wrap up, there's one more thing I want to touch on, those Voyager spacecraft. They're like the ultimate adventurers, right? Out there exploring beyond the planets into interstellar space. This course mentioned they're carrying golden records with them. Oh yeah, the golden records. Like a message in a bottle, but on a cosmic scale. They contain sounds and images from Earth, music, greetings in different languages, even diagrams of human anatomy. It's wild to think about, you know, <laughs> those little spacecraft carrying a piece of us with them as they drift through the vastness of space. Maybe someday someone or something will find them. It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? A reminder that we're part of something much, much bigger than ourselves. It really is. Well, this deep dive has been an incredible journey. We've explored the fiery heart of our sun, journeyed past planets and moons, and even ventured into the asteroid belt. It just goes to show there's always something new to discover right on the edge of our cosmic backyard. Absolutely. And the best part is... We're still just getting started. Who knows what incredible discoveries await us in the future. Maybe we'll uncover some of those discoveries together in our next deep dive. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and keep exploring.